Thank you. Thanks for coming. So last year, I think I spoke down here as well, and there I did one of my normal Erlang priesthood things of propagandizing how wonderful Erlang is and how it turns into money and all those things that you need to convince people about doing business and all those things uh, there. And um, that's also normally how I get contacted to, to talk at conferences. Because people, we want to spread the happy gospel of Erlang and get the church of Erlang going and all that. And I got invited last year to do a, a talk at uh, NDC in London uh, by a, a good guy called Brian Hunter. Uh, there, and we agreed, yes, we'll do this thing. And then he comes up, but I'd like to know how you think. He says, think? How I think? I don't, I don't think when I program, I feel. Like Garrett said, I feel, and I feel good, because I do it in Erlang. So I feel really good there. But then, OK, fine. I'll put together something on thinking like an Erlanger, and it, it has evolved over time uh, there. So I'll try to take you through the mind of at least my head as an Erlanger. But I think this, the things I'm talking about applies to how a lot of people think, and also some ideas about how you can approach uh, Erlang programming, because one of the things uh, what Garrett also has done some story, studies on, you, if you saw the keynote, that Erlang is hard to learn. And one of the reasons Erlang is hard to learn is because it's different. It's not like all the other languages out there. It's different. It's special. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and you like to, to do it. But the thing is, and, and, and if, you, if you want to see for yourself, Go take, take one of those maps where they show the lineage of, of time over uh, programming languages. And then there'll be this, you're going, but Erlang is not on the list. What are you doing? So you have C, you can see that C turns into C++, and then you get Java. And then you get other things that are even worse. Uh, so there you go. Um, but Erlang is on, not on the list. So there are reasons for that, but there's also one good thing from, from that. Erlang is not on the list is your number one reason why you want to learn programming is, because it teaches you to think in a different way. And that is very important. So, with this in mind, little question for you. Do you want to see the Erlang code? Yeah. 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 You can't handle the Erlang code. <laughs> and that's important here. If you behave nice, I might show you a bit of uh, code. But the thing here is, this is very, very important when we talk about these things. Syntax is utterly irrelevant. When I was, when I was, this is the first time I saw Erlang, I thought syntax was horrible. <laughs> Capital letters and extra R's and everything, horrible. And that was when I was 28 or something like that. So I've aged a bit since then, and I've actually come to realize that syntax doesn't matter. Except that you're doing Java, then. It matters a great deal, and then it's a different thing, but there we go. But what does matter, thinking is everything. So if you leave here with anything today, is forget about syntax, doesn't matter, thinking is everything. And this is what you need to take into whatever language you're forced to write in. Because if you're not forced, of course, don't need a new language. So there we go. So now we come down to thinking, and then we have this thing. So, we all know that Erlang came out of telecom. So when you look at these things, and you can then also abstract it away, but basically a, a domain like telecom has a number of things you need to do in that domain in order to solve the problems. If you're not solving the problems, you're not being paid, and yeah, then it goes bad. So you can take the, the standard approach, and you can pick something like C++ or Java, or something equally monstrous uh, there, and you can try to solve the problem, meaning that you need to fill out a huge gap. This is good if you're a manager. Now, why is it that good? It's good because that means you need to have an army of people reporting to you. Having an army of people reporting to you means you're important. So <laughs> there you go. So that, that's a good reason uh, for, for uh, languages to exist in big organizations because you can't solve small problems with this. You can only make big problems and big headaches. And <sighs> you can get degrees in project management. <sighs> I get tired. OK, but then, then comes along Erlang. Erlang is a domain-specific language. It was created to solve the needs of telecom, which means that it fills out uh, a lot more of the space in telecom, meaning that there's a lot less you need to write. Okay, now you can already see 
that the managers are going, oh, scary, scary. That means that I'll have less people reporting to me, or maybe there won't be a need for a manager. <laughs> scary stuff. <coughs> but that's actually important, because this is all where this smaller gap means there are benefits. One of the good benefits is that you can express your thoughts more directly. So the feedback loop will be shorter. And the, you know what they say? The breakfast of champions is feedback. The more feedback you get, the faster you can learn. So this is about, again, in early terminology, fail fast, learn from mistake, mistakes, and improve faster. It's just the way things work. Another way of saying this is that those benefits equals into money. But we will not dwell into that. It's more the feedback loop and actually the fact that it's this small gap makes it fun to program. Um, I had a colleague at Motorola, well, more than one, because it was a big company that did things in C and C++, so here you go, you can see where that's going. But we were two, we have got onto this Erlang bandwagon, and then we convinced uh, management that we should grow our team by 50%. <laughs> yeah, we get one guy extra, that's how percentages work. So we go around and we should try shopping for a person willing to learn this thing Erlang and work with us. I don't know what, which part of those that he was most afraid of. But anyway, he came to the conclusion. He said, guys, you're interesting. I'd like to work with you, but I'm not sure about this Erlang thing. Okay. Six months later, we, allow, we are asked to downsize our team by 33%. <laughs> he had to go, so basically. And then he's just sitting there, and he went to his boss. I know I can't be on the team anymore, but can I sit next to these two guys so I can smell the Erlang? <laughs> this is how much fun Erlang is. You don't want to go. He was clinging onto his table. Yeah. So one of the things out of the telecom domain that's very important for, for solving problems is protocols. And that is actually something that too few people are taught. There, there's a feeling that protocols is about flipping small bits uh, there, and it's all about telecom. Protocols is the sugar of the world. This is how you make things work. And they, here I have two books uh, to recommend. Of course, you all have a copy of, of a horse commun communicating sequential processes. Please. Yes, there's one there. Good. Then don't be as stupid as me. Don't go on a summer school with Tony Hoare and not bring your copy to have it signed. <laughs> stupid. Stupid. So I think I'll fix this this year. Uh, but that's another story. And then another thing here, and this is a Springer book, unfortunately. So it cost a whopping $120 uh, there. I, clean, I have hung on to that book. But normally, when you take that class at university, you sold on the book because it was just too expensive to have around. But this one was so good that I, with my limited funds, hung on to that one. It is very good. It talks about how you design protocols. It, funnily enough, uses CSP to describe these protocols. And it's brilliant. Yeah, it's worth the money. So the thing is, you use protocols for a lot of things, and you should be using them a lot more. So here we have one, Paxos um, consensus protocol. Of course, they decided <coughs> yeah, to write it up in ASCII so that it becomes really illegible and, and things like that. But protocols are all around us, and that is what we should do and think about when we design programs. Even if you are so unfortunate that you have to write a Java program, you should be thinking about protocols. Anybody can be a single page programmer and write a Java object. Anybody can do that. Making Java objects work together is about protocols. So that's why you need to focus. <coughs> and then, of course, you learn to think about protocols using the one true language on the earth. The golden trinity of Erlang, and that's, of course, Erlang. So this, this is what makes Erlang special. The golden trinity is something I came up with while taking a walk. I took a walk because People will say, you shouldn't be using Erlang. So, okay, I'll take a walk and deal with this problem. And then you have to think about these things. So I thought about, if I had to strip something from Erlang, what would I strip and still code in it? But which things would I take out and make it go, then I can code in something else. And these are the things that are left in the language uh, when you take that exercise, at least when I do it. So you have share nothing. So you're not sharing anything between the processes you have in your system. Sharing memory is bad. I and mean, when sharing nothing means, of course, that you also have to send messages between these processes. So that's one pillar. Another thing is you fail fast because trying to resolve everything 
by throwing exceptions around and catching them. It will lead you to one thing, one thing only. You will lose your hair, period. Find a Java programmer that has worked with this for 10 years, hair's gone, period. <laughs> it's exceptions that does that. So, okay, you can't run around and have programs just fail all over all the time. Okay, time for a little career advice. If you work in a company like Motorola that works on safety critical systems that have to work all the time, don't run around and say, we just let it crash. <laughs> People think you are insane. Oh, for me, of course, it's for the wrong reasons, but never mind. Don't say that. So in order to fix that, you add failure handling to the language, and then you can match these things out. So you have shared nothing, one pillar with message passing, and everything is nice. This is where the protocols live. You allow these protocols to, uh, or processes to fail fast, and then you supervise them and make sure you deal with the failures in a nice way. So that comes to the first one. So processes. They're so dead, dirt cheap, you just use lots of them. If, if you try to program, say, in a Python style and keep everything in one process inside Erlang, you're doing it wrong. It'll feel like programming in Python. And that comes with varying degrees of fun, mostly pain. So uh, don't do that. And you should use tons of them. You can spawn off, on a Raspberry Pi, the old version, you can spawn off something like 10,000 threads in Java, you can take 135,000 Erlang processes. They're that lightweight. Don't be afraid of using them. If you program Java, objects are cheap. Yes, fine. In Erlang, processes are cheap. Don't be afraid. Use them a lot. And then, coming back to protocols, focus on how they interact. Just having a lot of processes is, well, nice, but you need to focus on how they interact because that's how you solve problems in an uh, Erlang setting. So. I'm going to do something, and I warn you now, don't do this at home. It's very important, because some people take it very literal when I take the next example and show you how to use Erlang thinking on this problem. Of course you shouldn't be using Erlang on this, or maybe you should, but we'll come to that. So don't take it too serious. Just take it as a good example to show the thinking here. Good. Game of Life. Conway's Game of Life. How many are familiar with that? Exactly. Why do you think one chooses that example? Okay, yeah, never mind. We'll take the critics later. So, Cellular to Automaton, very simple. It is about evolution of cells um, in discrete time. And uh, the way it works is, you have one cell. You can see the one there in, in the middle. There, the next evolution of that cell depends on the neighbors around it. So that's those eight one around it there. If there are two or three neighbors around it, it stays alive. Uh, and survives. If it's empty and has exactly three neighbors, a new cell is born into that square there, uh, uh, the space there, and all others, they become empty. And if you've seen these game things run, and then it can make wonderful uh, patterns on your screen. Well, let's just show it. So here, I've written up one here, and, and a word of warning here. The world wraps around so the top and the bottom can see one another, and the sides can also see each other. Uh, that's a common thing here. So here's at, at time one, and then it starts evolving. And you can see, did I jump over time one? Yeah, well, trust me, it is this correct one. And you can see how they evolve and over time, and they have to see what the neighbors are like, figure out what the next value should be, and then you just move on like this. And I will not bore you totally to death with this one. This one is a configuration, I think it lasts 18 or 19 generations, and then it dies. It looks so good here, it survives six uh, time steps and it's good, doing great, but eventually it dies out uh, there. And there are people actually spending an enormous amount of time figuring out which, configura which configurations survive and which don't. But that's a separate area of research. So, the traditional approach to this. So now, we're thinking like a Java programmer. Trust me, after this talk, it, that, that kind of thing is out of your body, so don't worry. <laughs> and otherwise, if, if, if not, I will get you some Erlang patches you can put on and it will make it go away. So but we'll just, for two seconds here. So the normal approach to this, and this is how you see any textbook and program is saying, you take a 2D array, and then you take a new 2D array, and then you can compute from the one before the next one, and you do a for loop across the board, and do all of that. Yes, 
That's nice if you're doing a peer-to-peer program. What do we want to do? So there are some issues with this. And, and, and this is why people say, you can't say this, but I can. And I will. Uh, there. It does not scale well. Because if you do this, unless you start doing nasty parallel programming uh, t things, you need to actually run this sequentially for all things uh, there. And if you want to do it in Erlang, because why programming anything but Erlang, uh, these imperative data structures are really ugly. So now I want to solve this problem in Erlang. So, so this comes down to the basic Erlang idea. And that is one process per cell. Some people find that utterly, whoa, can you do that? Yes, you can. Uh, there. I've been running on my machine a grid of 300 by 300 processes. So that's 90,000 processes having fun doing game of life uh, there. It works. It scales there. And then that you let the processes talk to the neighboring cells, because that's what you do in Erlang. You have processes talking to one another by sending messages around. And where does this leave us on the mark? So that means we are down in the left-hand corner. We are down in the share nothing message passing area of the golden trinity of Erlang. So this is where we're going to stay for a little while and, and deal with these things. So when I'm a cell and I need to progress to the next time step, I need to know the values of what my neighbors are at this time step. And this you do with a little bit of protocol. So you collect the cell content of all your neighbors. Up, just so think of it, dots between the one and the eight there. Right there. And then you update your own content and you say, now I'm at time t plus one. So this is what you do normally in the 2D version there. And you click do. Here you just have a process. It goes out, talks to all its neighbors and say, OK, good. Uh, give me what your value is, and then I'll update myself when I've collected for all my neighbors. Very simple protocol uh, there. So, so then the question begs, is begging here, is this Erlang enough? What was one of the things I said about Erlang and processes? Use lots of them. Have I used lots of them here? No, oh, yeah, one per cell. Could I do a little more? I could try and do a little more. So, and we'll see if it's a good idea. Sometimes you have to experiment uh, there. So actually, every time I need to collect for a new time step, I create a collector pro a start a pro collector process that is responsible for contacting all the neighbors, collecting the results, and once it's done, it'll report back to the mother cell, you know what, this is what I figured out. <coughs> Figure out uh, what you want to do and how you want to progress to the next time step. Again, look at this, very nice, it's a protocol thing, nicely described with these MSCs that says messages going uh, back and forth. And this, that's a learning thing, this is how you design Erlang programs. You write up these things and start focusing on sending messages around. You do not spend your entire li life writing object inheritance trees. This is not important. The static structure is not important. It is the sending of messages between entities that's important. This is what we do here. And then the collector loop itself, you can see here, the top one here is that uh, as soon as it has nothing it's waiting on, okay, it has a number of uh, neighbors counted up, and then it sends a message back uh, to the mother cell. Next content should be this, go ahead. And in all the other times there, it receives, can receive, like, this is the receive statement here. Uh, if you receive from one of your nature a send cell content message, you do some updating and everything, and then you continue until, the again, you've completed that entire list. This is nice and easy and the naive way of doing this. So the question is, will this work? No, it will not work. So we'll go into see. it. And actually, we can sort of put a little bit of a, Provides on that, it works if, basically if, and also that's another thing, if you ever start to become a project manager of, uh, in any way leading other people, and you have your developer says, it works if, then it means that there are bugs in the program. So you need to, yeah. so, but this works if you only take one step at a time. So I only ask myself to do, cells to do, let's do one time step in this simulation, and then we stop again, and we see where we are. It'll work as long as you do that. Um, if you let the cells run freely, that actually doesn't work, but there, because there the cells get out of sync. How can the cells get out of sync 
Yeah. The thing is, you can request something from a neighbor where the neighbor has moved on to the next time step. So the neighbor is at time t2, and you're asking, what's your value at t1? And he'll just say, well, it's in my past. I don't know. So that won't work. And you can also be ahead of the, the game. You could be asking for cell value in the future for your neighboring cell. You've done, moved on to time two, and you ask your neighbor, what's your value at time two? And he's, no, I'm at time one. I don't know what my value will be at time two. We don't have uh, wormholes in our line. So we can't transport things through time and space and things like that. So we have to respect these things. But this can be fixed, luckily. So if you have a request for old time, something in your history, you just keep a history. That's straightforward. And if you have a future time request, somebody asks you for a value you, you will compute in the future, you just queue the response. And this, though it sounds like, okay, this is an artificial way of solving Game of Life, and what are you doing these things for? The point here is, in lots of places where you have what is here, asynchronous protocols, you will run into these kind of issues, which means you need to deal with these kind of things. And these two tricks, keeping history, and also queuing responses until you're ready to reply, typical patterns you come across a lot when you're doing Erlang programming. And it all comes down to using asynchronous uh, message passing. Good. Now, we move on to the next thing. Because, again, as I told you, went walking, come, came up with these things. Failure handling. You also need to look at failure handling in this. Because the, the code will not be correct. All things, bad things will happen that you couldn't foresee. So, so how do you do failure handling in this? You start supervising the cells in your system there. And then, if a cell dies, then the Erlang supervisor, just put in a standard Erlang supervisor uh, there, and then it restarts the cell with the original arguments. So if a cell started by saying, I'm cell number 7.5 in this grid, and I start with a value of 1, meaning I have something in me. Good, it has been started there. But the problem is, if you progressed and you've done a simulation down to time 100, all of the time you just computed, went away when you die. It's just gone. The process and the memory of the old process is gone, so you start from scratch. And that means all state, whatever you have, is lost. And this happens every time you have a process restarting in Erlang. It will, the new one that will be restarted, restarted with the same arguments, it will look like the same one, but it has lost all state, all history. Which is something to remember when you do things. But, again, there's a fix for this. You just monitor all the cells. So you can see if somebody's dying, I can do a fix to this. And what you do is you monitor, and when they die, you wait for the new cell to come alive, and then you say, please catch up with the rest of them. So if you have a simulation that has ran on to time 100, and a cell dies, when it comes back online, the one to replace the old one, you just tell it, you know what, run to time 100. This is where the rest of us are. Please catch up. So that's a, a way of fixing it uh, there. And then if you draw that up in a, in a diagram to show what you have, you have your main top-level supervisor. And then over here, you have a supervisor to supervise all of the individual cells. You have the cells here. And then over here, you have the cell manager that's responsible for monitoring cells when they go down. And when they're restarted, telling the new cell, the one that is replacing the old one, this is what you need to do to catch up with the rest of the world. And this, of course, can be written as a protocol. And it looks like this. Yeah, that's a bit in it. So here we're seeing that when the cell goes down, it dies for whatever reason. In Erlang, it means that it's sending out a down message because to the, to the process is monitoring. So the cell manager gets a down message for this particular process. And that means that it says, okay, the old cell here, I'm removing that from my registry. The manager is keeping track of who's around so we know uh, which processes relate to a certain cell in our simulation. Then the supervisor, the supervising in Erlang, they're that simple. They just restart stuff. Nothing else, just restart it. It starts a new uh, uh, cell uh, to represent the one that went away. And then it, that cell registers itself with the cell manager and then the cell manager says, okay, now I know cell IJ, I know the process identified you, 
I will monitor you now, and if you die, we'll fix things. And what it does is, it then takes track of, uh, there's a time module in, in this as well. It asks it, what is the maximum time that the rest of the cells have reached? And then it tells it back to the cell, please run up until max time. And then the cell that died before has now been replaced by a new one, and the new one is taking the full role of the old one, and it has speeded up to where the rest of them were. And again, this pattern also applies outside game of life. You have this situation, something goes down, and then you're looking at it, okay, I restart the process, how do I get it into the way so it works to the rest of my system? Sometimes you do need to do things like this, where you're forwarding it forward by saying, do certain things. In other cases, you can just restart it. But that's for the simple stuff. The code. I'll actually show some more code here. So here, this is what it looks like. The blue stuff here is the, the down message coming into the cell manager. And you can forget about the rest here. But this is actually, I'm getting a down message, then they do some bookkeeping. Yes? Oh, the neighboring cells will be blocked by the new, new respawn cells, and they could trigger the, the step before. Do we need the time module? Uh, we need the time module. Well, uh, the thing is, the different modes of overrun, yeah, I didn't go into the details of that, but I have different mo ways of running the simulation. I can just say, do a step, do a step, do a step. I can also say, run until you reach a certain uh, generation number, or I can tell them to run freely. And when I run into this situation, I can't avoid having the time in there to make sure that we sync up on something, because then you would have a new cell, you could just say, just run, and it will catch up. But the problem is, you wouldn't know when, that is, when it's done doing that, and if you're running in a different mode of a modus operandi there, you wouldn't be able to say, now we go back to doing stepwise things. So that's the reason why the time module is there. If you were just running them freely all the time, you wouldn't need it. You'd just say, run and catch up with the rest of them uh, there. Does that make? Mm. Good, yeah. Good question, good question. Yeah. No, so yeah, you get the down message, you do a bit of bookkeeping, and then you continue. Then the next step from the protocol is, you wait for the supervisor to restart it uh, there, and then that cell registers itself again with the cell manager, and then you go down here, and then you monitor the cell. So now you've got a control again. The cell manager is at all times monitoring all the cells in the system. So it can take appropriate actions uh, when they're... And then the, the, the thing that makes things come back to life is you have a kickoff cell here, and that is a function that tells it to do the right thing depending on what kind of simulation mode uh, you're in. And that looks like this. If it's a step thing, you just get the end time from the time module uh, there, and then run until that point in time, and then it switches over to doing the stepwise thing. If it's run, run until uh, simulation, you just tell it directly to do that. And if it's running, you just tell it to run. So I could simplify all of this by saying we don't have anything but running cells, and they'll just run forever uh, there. But then again, you'll have a very hot CPU after a while. Because one of the things, if you try this out, and there's a link to the code later in the slides, if you try this on out and you, you still do things like I do, running uh, uh, 10 thousands of processes together, they will be utilizing all your cores. Because that's how it just works in Erlang, by magic to there. Now, at this point, there's actually a problem. There's a deadlock. And this happens. When you ask the neighbor for, for a value, and it's a future value for him, and he queues the response. He says, I can't answer you right now. So he queues the response for you, and he waits until he's updated his cells to go to the next step, and then he'll send a reply back. Unfortunately, somebody comes along and kills him, or he dies for his own reasons uh, there. And then that queuing yeah, is part of the state of the process. And as we remember, processes that die, even if they're restarted by a supervisor, all the state is lost. So that he has to remember, he had forgotten about that he has to queue back and he has a response due to us when he gets to a certain time. And if you try and do these things, so that, and I've actually built into the program so you can just take and kill a random process just to see what happens uh, there, you will see this and then everything will stop because it's a deadlock. So we won't get any further 
uh, there. So how do you fix this one? Because one thing is you can realize what this problem is, you can go fix the code. But when you're dealing with real life stuff, the stuff that people pay you money to do, asynchronous protocols, they're nasty, so don't try and just fix it. You do something elaborate on the testing side. And that's where you use QuickCheck. How many of you are familiar with QuickCheck? Quite a few. Happy people. Happy people. The rest of you, you can be even more happy by dwelling into QuickCheck. So, word of advice. So use QuickCheck and do it operation by operation there. And that operation by operation then ties back to looking at the MSC you created for the protocol you're looking at. That gives you all the clues you need on how to write the different steps of the quick check test. So, some tricks are in order to do this. You can't just snap your fingers and do this. Quick check or equacy, Erlang quick check, is built on the notion of doing synchronous uh, function calls, meaning that it does something, it checks the return value, and then everything is good. So, if you want to do asynchronous stuff like protocols here, you need to do something, and that is called mocking in EQC. So, it has, uh, that has one thing, that solves that problem. Then it has another problem. You cannot call your own module. So you saw before, we have cells talking to other cells. So you're calling out and calling another cell inside the module. You cannot do that. So you add a protocol module, and I'll show you how that looks. And then, because quick check, synchronous, sometimes you need to sync with your process that's living its asynchronous life. So you need to add functions, help a function that allow you to sync at certain times in the life of the process. This is what you need to do to test it. And trust me, the alternative to this is to run a randomly big grid of processes and then try to guess if they've been running for a while that they are in the correct state and that all sorts of interleaving of things are working. That is not doable. That is, that's why some companies hire test departments with hundreds of engineers to do this. We do not want to do this. We buy one quick check license, we have one good guy working on it, or girl, and then you fix the problem. Yeah, of course you don't get 10 managers out of that, that's, that's a different thing. So the protocol module basically is, if I query for the content, it's in a separate module, query for the content of a cell, you just call back to the cell, so you have this thing of calling out and then calling back in, because that allows you to do the mocking. And that is typical with these asynchronous things uh, there. So that's a trick to keep in the book. And then the syncing. So I, you saw earlier, I spawned off this collector process. So when I sync with that, then it has a little receive clause. Part of the receive clause the collector loop has is that you can get a status out. And that is the typical way of doing these things. Don't just do a sync function. Do a status function you can use for debugging. That is often a good thing to have anyway. So don't just, okay, I'll just do this for testing, but do something that also has a, a meaningfulness in terms of debugging. For, for Game of Life, that debugging is eh, not so relevant, but for a real-life problem, that kind of debugging aids perfectly good to have. It saves your hair, among other things. Yeah. Now, doing a step in this is, and this is the quick check model for this, and this is where the, you have to do a little bit of trickery here. So here, you're waiting until the collecting status changes from what there's no collecting status to something. And that is when you know that the collector process has been kicked off. And this is the only ugly thing in the quick check model. Now, the only really ugly things. There are a few other things that are ah, not so nice. But this is the only place where you do And this is how you always have to do it with quick check. If there's Asian kind of stuff and you need to wait for something to happen, make sure that things have happened, you need to do these things to ensure that you are at the right place and then you can evaluate things because otherwise QuickJet does, does the function call and it looks at the world and says, has everything happened? And in this case, we're spawning a process and that takes a bit of time for that to actually materialize. So that has, you have to wait for that uh, there. And then when you're doing the step here, then one of the things you're expecting, and this is you need to ask all your neighbors here, and that in, in quick check terminology and mocking language there is call outs. So you're expecting to see these processes, um, se the process sending out messages to other processes, and that's called call outs in this case. And here you can see that the call out expected to go to our protocol uh, module, and that's why these calls have to be mocked and put in a separate module uh, to do it. And now, 
I don't have a run of it, but that actually painfully highlights the deadlock thing. And you can probably check it out on GitHub and check out at the right point and say, okay, this is, it shows the deadlock and then you need to fix it. Now, how you fix it is that you let the collector loop monitor the neighboring cells. It's asked for a value and it's expecting a response back. And it knows, given to the design and the protocol, if that process that it's waiting for goes down, it will not remember to send a response back. This is tough luck. So here you have the, the fix for it up here is that if your neighbor is going down because you're monitoring them, then you go down here and you spawn a new uh, a little function to wait for the uh, uh, neighbor to come back. And then when it comes back, you get a new message in here. The neighbor is back, it's a new one, and you can then monitor it again. And then you stay in control at all times. And then again, this pattern is not just for game of life. Every time you have one of these situations, if somebody you're depending on goes down, you take the down message, you wait for the replacement to come back online, and you monitor it again. This is how you build a robust system. I double dare you to try and do this in C++ or Java with threads. This is where you will lose your teeth yeah. as well. Good. So the recap here is a process per cell in this situation, short-lived processes for small tasks. This would also work in other situations there. Focus on the protocols between the processes. This is the thing that one should burn most computer science professors on the stakes for, that they're not teaching enough of this. Protocols, go ask for it. If you're still in university, go ask for having classes and pro protocols. It's the only thing that matters when you get out there. And the thing is, if you do a little bit of protocol, this is a career-wise again uh, there, if you know protocols and you know how to deal with this, you will be like, <coughs> among the blind, the one-eyed is king, you will look insanely intelligent by even being average just because you picked the right tool to solve a complex problem. So you've taken the hint here, and I will now take 50% of all your bonuses going forward. So, good. I use the supervisors to restart uh, things, basic earning stuff, and then you have this monitoring, manager process on the side to get things that are restarted up to speed. Uh, there, good. And then, thinking in Erlang, Trying to sum it up there, focus on the protocols, the MSCs, I've said that a number of times, I'll say it again, focus on the protocols, it's the only thing that matters, and if you have to do Java, focus on the protocols, if you have to do C++, <laughs> there, thank you, good, yeah, and then, and this is where you can, <laughs> you can do this in Java as well, ask what could go wrong here, and then within days you will be seeing a psychiatrist because in Java everything can go wrong. But this is what you have to do in Erlang. You just ask what could go wrong here because that's a natural way of thinking about things. Because we have this supervisor thing, we have the fail fast uh, there, so please go ahead and do that. And then tools and doing lots of processes. Spawn these small, short-lived processes for small things. Please, please do that. Use supervisors to keep things in order. There, link and monitor where needed. That's also important. And then you have some, there's another trick which didn't work out for, for Eagle, but in, in many cases, if you need to have processes and you need to have a, a name for them and look them up, there's a library called gproc. That can be very, very good for some of these things. The problem is gproc dies in a very hard way when you're putting 90,000 uh, Game of Life cells into it. It just dies under the pressure because it's not supposed to handle that. So I don't use it incorrectly uh, there. Use some timeouts. They can also be useful, but that's, I haven't shown anything. And then you can also have things like transaction logs, ledgers, but you can see some of my oil presentations. I see more the description of those. But these are different techniques to solve this problem and do it well. And then the testing. Remember this. Asynchronous protocols are nasty. This is why people do not like to do them. But asynchronous protocols is what you need if you want to build a scalable system that's robust. So it's like a chicken and egg problem. You need to accept it, but they are nasty. I couldn't generate blood running down from the nasty here. I need to look at that, but they are really nasty. But you embrace them because that's where the money is. 
Uh, there. Use uh, running quick check for it, probably be set. Focus on one process and mock the calls to the others. Good. And then if you want to see more of the code, you can go to this GitHub repository. Uh, I think most of the stuff is on the testable branch, uh, but I'll merge it into master uh, soonish. Uh, there, so you can see everything uh, there. If you have questions on that code, don't worry, write me a mail. Uh, do a PR if you have a, a way of fixing my horrible code. Uh, that's uh, perfectly okay. Good, and then we're in Krakow, so I have to say something about Elixir. Uh, because otherwise, um, we had a webinar recently and people asked, but why aren't we just doing everything in Elixir? Well, you could sort of, but, let's, but it's built on top of the Erlang VM, which is a good thing. The Erlang VM is a wonderful piece of machinery. If, if you're in, in any sort into Erlang, is Robert here? No, Robert Birding is around here. He's one of the creators that you just go shake his hand and say thank you for the VM. It's, 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 you have to do that. It has more Ruby-like syntax for those uh, that are interested. Again, syntax is irrelevant, but for some people it's, it's a big thing. So you can also do some hygienic macros, so that means you can do domain-specific languages quite easily if you're into that sort of thing uh, there. It has better support for data handling, and I think that is probably one of the key selling points uh, uh, of using uh, Elixir, is that Erlang is a ping-pong language. It's created by Ericsson, and they pay ping-pong a lot in, in, in Sweden. So there you get a message, you send it back. In Elixir, it's like playing uh, rugby or something, because you get past something, and then you're allowed to run with the ball, and then somebody can come and kill you, and then you pass the ball on again. So you can do a little bit more. So Elixir is like rugby or something, uh, compared to Erlang with this ping pong. But the underlying thing is, you can't do good Elixir without understanding the Erlang programming model. So you need to embrace the golden trinity of Erlang in order to, to work on either of these things on the Erlang VM. Share nothing, message passing, fail fast, link monitor, and asynchronous testing with EQC. Thank you. And Question. Yeah, you can keep one, you can only keep the last one around and then you can just progress. So, does this kind of, uh, because it's a big trade of it in terms of memory, uh, does this kind of trade of how many you play in real life uh, applications? Uh, yeah, uh, in, in real life, you wouldn't probably keep the entire history around in the process. If you have history you want to keep in a real life, life uh, program, you'll start putting some of it away to disk. You will store it if you need it for later, but you, you will also go in and say, make a trade-off and say, there's part of my history that's important for snappy things, and you'll keep that in the process, and there are things that are, I don't really have a lot of chances where this will be necessary, so I'll just put this away. So that's a normal thing you will do with, with, in a real system. You could do a snapshot thing uh, for that uh, there. So, so that different. You wouldn't normally. It's a very good uh, observation. You normally wouldn't keep the entire history in a normal system around uh, there. That's also why I talk about ledgers, because ledgers are like a way of saying now we've agreed a, a synchronous point. We agree on something. We put it down, and then when we start again, we'll ask the ledger how far are we, and then we you fast forward to that point in time. So that's why it, it's again an example to show things and then other things where you need to, when you go more serious. More questions? How do you handle a uh, supervisor uh, or monitor process going down? The supervisor going down. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking if... Uh, how, how would you handle a uh, supervisor or monitor processes uh, when they go down? Yeah, good. That's a very good question because that, that, that comes down to how do you deal with the fact that you can't protect and protect and protect and protect and get things to work? So what you do is, and this is where a, a key thing, a lot of people say, I can't use the Erlang supervisor, I'll write my own. Don't do that. A supervisor is simple, it's very simple, and it's supposed to just restart. So the problem is, a supervisor then, if it restarts its children too much, it will die itself. And then 
you need to have something above it to say, what do I want to do here? Do I want to restart here or what? And then the thing is, then you have this, like you saw here with the cell manager, you might have another process on the side that is doing some business specific logic to if the supervisor is going down. Because the supervisor above the supervisor will just restart it until it runs out of tries. And the, thing, the key thing is that you only try, you see, I only protected the cells with this extra process on the side because they are the important part of my system. And if, if things are going so badly that you run out of restarts, you probably are better off that the whole pro uh, program dies. It is rare that it happens, but it can happen. So that's, you don't stop all supervisors from dying. You need to take a trade-off here. And the beauty in Erlang compared to, to Java uh, there is that you are not dead from one exception killing you. You can decide which things to fix and how the rules are for restarting. But you should not try and cover everything. It, it's not like that. But then the other thing is, it's separated from the rest of the code. All the supervisor stuff happens outside the wonderful, joyous coding you're doing that makes you feel good. It's outside the golden path. So, but it's still, it's a trade-off you need to make, even in Erlang. It's not like the silver bullet to solve all problems there. Yeah. So, so this is about guarantees of message delivery there. In Erlang, there's, there are no guarantees of message delivery. None whatsoever. Because that's the only sane decision to take operating in a system that is potentially distributed across machines. You cannot know. And the guarantees, if you wanted guarantees, the amount of stuff you have to build in is enormous and it won't work. So the, it's asynchronous message passing, but what you will know is if you've sent a message to a process and it hits the mailbox of that process, it stays in that mailbox until the process takes it out or the process dies and takes the mailbox into the gray with it. And therefore, it will be delivered only once there, but you cannot be guaranteed of it ever reaching. If a process, you have the process identifier and say, send it a message, and that process is already dead, you don't, you're not alarmed. You don't get any message whatsoever. <laughs> so that thing is design can thank uh, also, because you can use the message in the somewhere around on the network. And yes, that's why you use timeouts, and that's why you use monitoring for things, so you can get a control over this. But the thing is, most of the monitoring and, and, uh, will, will happen outside the regular code, and it will be some extra error handling code you can think about at a later stage. But you're right, absolutely right. How do you scale timeouts? Sorry? How do you scale timeouts? You never know what machine you're driving, and you have to adjust the timeout somehow. Okay, so scaling timeout. Well, that is dependent on the, the system you're doing. Because if you're sending something, you have distributed it over a number of machines, you need to sit and look at what is the latency of my network, what's a reasonable timeout here. So. <laughs> No, you, a little bit of calculation, but you can use rules of thumbs for these things. And you say, okay, if I'm not getting a response back in five seconds, five seconds is a long time, then something is probably wrong and I need to start doing something like kill myself and, and say that uh, there's a, a problem higher up. Yeah. It, it's, it's what you do in Erlang, right? If, if things are not working, you kill yourself. Yeah. So... Actor-based programming in general, my take on that is it's, it's amazing. Because one of the things that's good about actor-based programming is that it separates... Um, it, it, an actor in most languages will have its own thread of execution, meaning that you're hiding all the ugly threading in programming languages, and you get a focus on sending a message to that actor. If it's not message passing as it is in Erlang, it's, it's something very similar, similar to it conceptually. So actor-based is awesome, very good. Just don't think you'll be as happy in those languages as you'll be in Erlang. I was thinking the answer would be something like you are cheating yourself, just do proper Erlang. No, you can do you, If you're forced to it, just take the ideas from Erlang and apply it to something else. But remember, it's not the real McCoy. 
There are certain benefits. And, and, and the thing you will see is, all this I'm talking about, fail fast at supervision. This is what you're not getting as easily in other languages. There's a reason why a company like WhatsApp have bedded their entire infrastructure on Erlang. Because these kind of problems will occur. Errors will happen when you start doing a system with 500 machines. There's a reason why a gambling company like Bet365 that are moving millions of pounds around every second. There's a reason why they're betting their infrastructure on Erlang. Because shit will happen and you need to be able to deal with it when it does. Because the worst thing that can happen for a gambling company is that the flow of money through their system stops. If you take out a little bit of that flow, because one process is dying, everything is good. You're still making a ton of money. If you have a Java exception taking down your entire website, the entire flow of money is just gone. And if you're moving millions of pounds through the system every minute, you don't want the system to go down. So, yes? Okay, so I think it's time. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Thank you.